Well, hi, everybody who's here. Um, I'm just going to give us a couple minutes to let people join. I know it's been a long day, lots of talks. Um, so hopefully some people are still trickling in. But um, I'm Alden. I'm from the research application management team at the Turing. And this workshop will be led by Dustin, who is a research associate at the Turing, working on low traffic neighborhoods. Um, I've put a, um, a link in the chat to a Google Doc that we can all use. It has uh, the agenda for the workshop, as well as some useful uh, links that Dustin has added. And if you scroll all the way down to, um, you can add your, add your name and info, um, kind of a collaborative document where we can say hi, but we can also use the chat, especially for um, questions. But we would love it the most if you will ask to unmute yourself and ask questions um, directly in the session, you know, once Dustin's ready for questions. But I will monitor the chat, and if anyone wants to add questions there, I'll, I'll ask them. And then um, just one tip is try to use the full screen mode. So if you see your um, the black area of the screen where we are now in the bottom right corner, there's a full screen button. And that really helps because when he's sharing the screen, it, it gets a little cluttered. And then above that in the top right, that's where you can ask to unmute and um, and come on video. And we'd really, really love to, to see your faces, at least hear your voices and uh, get some discussion going. So with that, I will turn it over to Dustin. Thanks. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I'm Dustin Carlino with the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, and this is a talk about designing low traffic neighborhoods using software. Um, so let's get started. Uh, yeah, so this will be um, hopefully about like a 40, 50 minute uh, talk. And then um, I want to leave a lot of room for discussion at the end. Um, but sort of to start out, uh, the I guess like the motivation behind low traffic neighborhoods sort of in the beginning comes from the fact that there are way too many cars uh, in, in most cities today. And so this causes a, a number of externalities, um, ranging from climate impacts to, uh, to health and just like social, uh, well-being. And, um, there's, I guess, a lot of excitement behind electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles and other new technology that will mitigate some of these problems, but, um, that won't really solve all of the problems. I think ultimately cities to be, to be more sustainable need to, uh, shift focus towards active travel, like walking and cycling. Um, and away from personal vehicles. So uh, to motivate low traffic neighborhoods, particularly um, in the UK since 1994, uh, the amount of traffic on um, residential roads in urban areas has gone up about 36%. And this is kind of due to two causes. First is that uh, there's more congestion along main roads. And um, now people have uh, mobile, mobile apps and sat nav that'll help them route around traffic detours. And so, um, Previously, if somebody had local knowledge of an area, maybe they like, you know, when the main road is backed up, they knew how to cut through the neighborhood, but now everyone can do it because, uh, you know, your phone just tells you where to go. And so this is a, a huge problem for people living on these streets that were that were not designed to uh, to have this much traffic. And so as a response, um, particularly around the UK, planners use something called a modal filter to uh, to, to calm a particular street. And so um, in, in physical form, this is something like, uh, like these are the, the tactile urbanism example, uh, very cheap to build, um, just like wooden planters. And then we also have um, different types of bollards. Sometimes they're like removable, uh, sometimes they're more permanent. Um, but these, these are called modal filters because they, uh, they stop uh, drivers from, from like passing large vehicles through. But if you're walking, cycling, or on a scooter, something like that, you can, you can pass through easily. Um, this is a, an example of modal filters that I, I think are a lot uh, older. Um, and they're they're actually like cement sort of part of the pavement, um, right? So if uh, if you place a modal filter along a particular road, you of course expect that one road to um, to see lower levels of vehicle traffic, uh, and maybe some some streets nearby. But um, there's a way to to place them strategically, uh, so that they actually like the the traffic calming effects expand to a wide area, and uh, that's what's called a low traffic neighborhood or an LTN, um, and that's what this talk is kind of about. So. This is a very, uh, like LTNs are a very hot political topic because um, during the pandemic, the uh, the DFT released this thing called the Active Travel Fund and um, local authorities everywhere began um, planning interventions such as LTNs. And so um, like because of the constraints of the pandemic, some of the consultation process moved a lot faster than usual or it was moved online. Um, and I guess like overall, the, the response to LTNs has been very mixed. If you like read any, uh, like main newspapers today, you'll, you'll see 
a lot of uh, heated arguments kind of for and, for and against them. And um, I think a lot of the, the debate kind of comes down to like miscommunication about um, exactly what the proposed changes are and uh, like a lack of, of proper community engagement. And so um, to kind of take a look at this, uh, once a an area sort of designs, or once planners design an LTN, they communicate it using a diagram that looks like this. Um, I think this is very like visually ap appealing and easy to understand uh, diagram. The, the colored areas tell you uh, where it's possible to to drive through the neighborhood and, and not. So for example, if you want to cross east to west, uh, like from Boston Road to Northfield Ave, uh, you can't do so because the like these new filters in the middle of the street have have sectioned things off. Um, I think people are are fairly able to to understand these, but um, unfortunately, it, it takes some time to produce these diagrams. And so, uh, imagine you're a planner trying to run like a live workshop. Like you you get a bunch of people from your community into a room, and um, you want to sort of talk about the the traffic issues people are experiencing in the area, and uh, maybe design something together. Um, and this is an approach that uh, a planner named Brian Deegan takes. And um, there's uh, this, this screenshot comes from a webinar that was originally the inspiration behind the software. Um, and so sort of the, the problem is like during that live planning process, the uh, sort of state of the art is, is drawing like lines and circles on top of a map um, and kind of imagining the, the resulting LTN um, and like the, the resulting ways for people to, to drive through an area from that. Um, and so this is this is pretty low tech. I think there's a, there's a way to kind of improve on this. Um, and neither the you know this process or even the the final diagram, like none of that really gives people what they're familiar with. Like people know how to use uh, Google and Apple Maps and just like ask it for a route. And if there's you know a road closure, um, these apps will tell you how to how to still drive around it and and tell you the expected time it'll take to to do the detour. Um, but there's not a way with these these like large commercial services to plug in proposals for for road closures uh, and see the same thing. But this is the the sort of interface that people would be familiar with, and I think would like alleviate a lot of confusion around LTNs. Um, and so because of that, uh, or because of all of these reasons, um, the a couple months ago I started working on a uh, a project to design LTNs with software. And so let's uh, let's take a look. Um, if, uh, if you happen to have attended the talk yesterday or if you've used an, an earlier version of the software, uh, be advised, I just released the new version that has um, a few new fixes and I'll, I'll talk about them in a bit. Uh, but yeah, so this is the software running in um, a part of Bristol. So, uh, you know, at first glance, it's sort of a, a map of the area with these these different colored uh, regions and the each, each region sort of corresponds to what the software thinks of as a neighborhood. So if we click on one of them, um, it'll kind of fade the rest of the map out and then focus on uh, on on just this neighborhood. And so, um, if we zoom in, the hopefully the like the color scheme should be a little bit reminiscent of those uh, of, of that diagram from earlier. And so, um, the colors show where it's possible to drive between uh, with without leaving the neighborhood. And so, for example, um, if you start in this in this purple area and you want to move to the yellow, there's no streets that connect it. You have to to exit onto the main road and then re-enter the neighborhood. And so, um, because they're, they're sort of disconnected from each other, the, the colors are separate. Um, and sort of the same is true elsewhere. Like for example, this, uh, this is a very small um, yellow area where all you can do is, is drive north through it and uh, you can't connect to anything else unless you use the main road. And so um, they kind of move over to uh, the very large purple cell here. You'll notice that this one's sort of massive. Like there's, uh, you can definitely spot some ways to, to sort of avoid the main road um, that's like border, bordering this area to the north or the south, and like there, there's some ways to cut through the neighborhood, uh, and the the different colors of red are trying to show where that's the most likely, and so um, this tool lets us place those new filters. So like for example, we could drop a filter here, um, and if we zoom in, like imagine just you know putting down planters and bollards in the middle of the road, and so uh, this one filter, you'll see that it changes the colors um, because now if you enter in uh, this you know from this one entrance, like you you can't really go anywhere except back out. Um, and so we've actually like split the split this large cell into into other pieces. Um, but sometimes if you if you place the filter, it doesn't really have an immediate effect. So like imagine um, you know we see a lot of rat running down Crown Hill, and we're we put a filter here. Uh, it will like the the roads here uh, be, like went from from dark red to white, meaning like there's now probably no traffic uh, along these roads. But um, if you if you watch like the the color red. Uh, sort of deepens um, to the south. And so all we've done here is just displace the traffic a little bit uh, to the south. Like this this is not a low traffic neighborhood yet. Um, all we've done is sort of move the problem down. And so we can try a second filter. Um, and actually now we, that does sort of disconnect the, 
uh, the two cells from each other. Like before we have um, this very, very large blue cell and uh, with two filters, it'll, it'll disconnect it into these two regions. Um, and so like that, that's the basis of this tool. Uh, it just takes the, like the final diagram that people use to communicate and gives people a way to just click on roads and, and kind of immediately see the effects. Um, and like sometimes whenever you have a very large area like this, uh, individually clicking on streets can be a little bit tedious. And so there's also um, like a little freehand lasso tool. Like I can take and just sort of draw the shape that I want um, and it'll add filters along those roads. And in fact, that uh, like the shape that I drew wasn't enough. It didn't split the cell. So um, if I kind of try again, like now we've split the cell, but actually uh, if you noticed a, a warning popped up uh, down here and it's coloring this, these areas red because actually this is a problem. Um, maybe it's easier to see here. There's uh, with these two filters, now it's impossible to access um, this part of the neighborhood from the outside world uh, if you're driving. And so that's kind of a problem. Um, we've like disconnected a cell. And so uh, the software will warn you if, if, it's, if you've made that, that type of mistake. Um, right, so this is the, the basic uh, premise of the tool. If we undo all of the filters, um, sorry, there we go, uh, and then explore a little bit where this um, this red coloring comes from, there's a, a tab called rat runs. And so this this is the, the basis of the heat map uh, showing what roads are likely to be busy or not. So this is a particular route through the neighborhood that drivers can take today. Um, they enter in on the south, kind of make all these turns and then cut back out near uh, Two Mile Hill Road. So this is just like one example of a way to cut through cut through the neighborhood. Um, and the software predicts about 440 of them. Like we could quickly scroll through um, and see all the different variations. Like for a human to to sit there and, and reason about these is quite difficult. But you know, in, in software, it's it's uh, it's not hard to automatically uh, calculate all of these and and see which ones are uh, are, are more likely or, or of a certain length or whatever. Um, so th this is just the basis of the uh, of, of this heat map. And also in this view, like if, if your uh, community was concerned about a particular rat run, like let's say um, this is the one that people were concerned with and we put a filter here, um, you can see how this one rat run, like people taking this one particular path that maybe uh, your residents have noted is occurring a lot in practice, like we can just see how it'll um, respond to changes we make. And you know, in this case, uh, it, it probably like we, we need to be more strategic about how we fix this particular problem because there's a lot of ways of getting through. Um, right, so uh, the next thing you can do is, um, a, a tool that's more meant for residents. And so uh, imagine that we we do have some proposal, like let's say um, we add a bunch of filters that look like this, I'm just kind of making stuff up. And actually I, I broke it, but I'll, I'll leave it that way for a minute. Um, like once we, once we sort of have a proposed scheme, uh, we can go plan a route. And this is meant to be um, reminiscent of, of just like a, a Google Maps type, type interface. And so like imagine somebody in the area uh, at a public uh, at a public consultation says, "Okay, um, I'm concerned about the scheme because you know I uh, I have to drive from here to here, you know, for whatever reason." Um, so they can just uh, like sort of type in the the route that they or uh, type in the, the area that they usually try to drive, um, and this tool will show them the the route under different uh, under different considerations. And so um, it's kind of like four different routes uh, shown, and the the color scheme definitely needs a bit of work. Um, but the idea is that uh, like before any of the, the filters in this neighborhood were placed, we have like the red route and it takes about four minutes. Um, and then once we add uh, some of the filters to the neighborhood, then the, the driving route has to detour a little bit uh, and kind of cut around the main roads, but it still takes about four minutes. Um, and uh, like the whole point of LTNs is to, to encourage people that um, like driving isn't necessary in the first place and uh, like walking and cycling should be viable al alternatives. And so, um, there's also uh, like it'll it'll show the the approximate biking and, and walking route that people can take. Although there's some caveats with uh, with how this works. Um, yeah, and then the, the last thing you can do here is uh, th this like the calculating the shortest driving route has some assumptions about the level of traffic on main roads. Like the whole premise behind um, LTNs being necessary in the first place is that uh, sometimes the main roads back up, and so uh, you have a way of kind of adjusting assumptions and saying like imagine that major roads during rush hour are like twice as slow as usual. And so you can sort of adjust that and see um, like maybe the route will want to cut through the neighborhood uh, more or less, you know, in a certain way based on those assumptions. Um, right, so we have this interface. And then um, the next thing we can do is uh, is compare different proposals. So imagine that like we're studying this one area and we have a, we have a lot of ideas for fixing the problem. Um, I previously uh, created created and saved a few other proposals. And so if I load them, um, and we click on the neighborhood, you can quickly compare the, the alternative ideas. And these are um, like, th these have key bindings. And so if I just press like one, two, three, four, 
we can quickly switch between the, the different ideas and get a sense of what roads are possible to, um, to drive between in the neighborhood or not. Uh, and we can take that same tool, like we can take the same route that we planned before and do the same comparison and say, you know, with, with proposal one, this is what someone's drive is going to look like. Uh, proposal two, you know, maybe they have to detour this way and so on. Um, and so my goal is for these tools to, in conjunction, make it a lot easier to do this design process uh, sort of like on the fly with, with residents in the room. Um, and then the, I guess the next thing I want to show uh, a demo of is um, over in Camden, close to the Turing office. Um, so the the, def the the tool sort of works at the neighborhood boundary, but the the boundaries inferred by the t uh, by the software are have a lot of caveats that I'll talk talk about in a bit. Um, but I just want to show you how you can adjust the the boundary. And so, like, if we're not happy with this blue area and we we want to expand it, um, we can click kind of block by block um, and change the shape of the boundary. Uh, and there's also a way to do this uh, just by like selecting freehand. And so. Um, you know, with this with this tool, we can kind of like select the whole area that we want to be considered the neighborhood, um, and then that kind of uh, lets us do the same do the same analysis and like draw filters through through the middle middle of this somehow, um, and the other boundaries around it will kind of change. So uh, yeah, so this is a, a dem an overview of what the tool can do, um, and now we're going to uh, to dive into some details about how it works. Um, so first of all, uh, this is available today at ltn.abstreet.org. And the link is also, it'll be in the chat and Google Docs and, and stuff later. Um, and I've been running the software just uh, on my machine locally, but you can also um, run it in your web browser without having to install. Uh, this is convenient, but a little bit slower. If, if possible, I would recommend, um, excuse me, uh, using the downloaded version. Um, and the tool changes about every week. Usually I do a release on Sunday. Um, and so like it's still under very active development. Uh, hopefully every week you'll, you'll see some improvements. And uh, yeah, so the software is completely open source, meaning um, you can take the code and modify it and work on it. Uh, and it's completely free to use. The you know, people designing LTNs are, are not, uh, you know, they don't have tons of public funding for this kind of thing. And like the funding they do have needs to go towards like actually physically making interventions. And so the, the software planning side should not be a barrier at all. I want, I want this tool to be used by uh, as many people without any, any limitations. Um, and the software is sort of meant for different groups. Uh, so if you, you know, if your job is to design LTNs and communicate them to the public, I, I very much hope the the tool uh, will help you do that a little bit faster. But then also, if you are just like living in an area and your council proposes an LTN and you don't like the idea uh, and you think you can do better, then this tool sort of gives you a way to come up with your own scheme and and talk about it uh, and start a conversation. So. Uh, the software works anywhere in the world, um, thanks to OpenStreetMap data. Uh, but of course, LTNs are kind of only an intervention that make, makes sense in city centers, I think. Um, and uh, there is an import process. And so the, the tool has a lot of places across Great Britain already imported. But if yours is missing, then there's a way to, to import yourself or to ask me to, uh, to bring in a certain area. Um, and a bit, about, a, a bit about how this tool was built. Uh, I'm the main person responsible, but uh, about a month ago, a UX designer from Seattle named Cindy Huang joined me, uh, and is is largely responsible for the for the app looking uh, good and being sort of arranged sensibly. Um, so I'm very grateful to uh, for her help. And uh, along the way, a lot of other people have given a bunch of feedback and sort of initial ideas about what this what this tool should do. So uh, particular thanks to these people. Um, and this uh, this LTN tool was built in a few months, and the reason that it was able to be done so quickly is that it's it's building on uh, prior work called AB Street that I've been doing for a few years. And uh, Michael Kirk and you and Lee are some of the my old teammates uh, who've sort of moved on, but a lot of this work wouldn't be possible without their their prior efforts. So thanks to them. Um, so this part of par this part of the talk is going to uh, to dive into how the how the software works. And even if you have no uh, computer science or programming background at all, I want to teach you a little bit um, and hopefully use enough pictures to kind of give you an intuition about how some of this stuff works. Uh, and yeah, you'll you'll walk away knowing a bit more. Um, this is kind of like the obligatory uh, system architecture diagram. Um, it's uh, the, the sort of takeaway here is that the software uh, works off of just like a one file per like imported area. Um, it's not like streaming in data from from a live map or anything like that. Uh, OpenStreetMap data and other other data that's particular to a particular or other data that's specific to a particular city is is sort of imported offline, uh, and then the the rest of the tool like works on that one file. Um, and so at the core, uh, most of the the sort of problems in this uh, in the software are based on a graph representation. And so if you have something like a street network where you know you have a bunch of intersections between roads and you have a like a road segment in between uh, each intersection 
like this is just a, a graph representation um, and, and sort of the edges between two intersections uh, have information about the lane configuration. You know, we know if it's a one-way street, we know if there's street parking, things like that, all based on OpenStreetMap data. Um, and so the first thing to, to explain is like, what does the software consider a neighborhood? It, it probably doesn't correspond to like a political, like an official administrative or political boundary or, you know, your intu intuitive definition of what the area is called. Uh, all it is, is it'll take uh, something classified as a major road, probably like an A or a B road, and um, trace along in a, in a loop and then take all of the space on the inside and call that the interior of the neighborhood. And so the sort of design philosophy behind LTNs is that the like the main perimeter roads are designed to handle uh, more traffic, but the, in, the interior of the neighborhood is not. And so, yeah, that's what the, the tool lets you explore. Um, and so like once we have this neighborhood boundary within it, we can talk about a cell. And so a cell uh, is each of these colored regions where um, it's, it's possible to drive from any, any building in the yellow area to any other building in the yellow area without leaving the neighborhood. Uh, that's all a cell is. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just to, to show you the, uh, the more zoomed in example, like between these two colors, the only way to, to connect, like there's no street going through, you have to exit onto the main road and then cut back in. Um, and I showed you an example earlier. If you, if you place uh, the filters incorrectly and actually like partition off a section of the, of the street network from the outside world, then you've made a mistake. Um, and the, the software will kind of warn you about that. And it's able to do that just by seeing if a cell has, uh, if it shares any borders with the perimeter of the, of the road. Um, so to ac actually calculate these cells, uh, if you're familiar with graph search algorithms, it's, um, it's, it's a, a fairly straightforward application of that. And so the idea is that we can start at a particular road in the middle of the neighborhood and sort of expand out and keep a list of roads that we haven't visited. Um, and this expansion process won't, cr won't cross any new filters that we've, cr we've created. So to kind of walk through this, um, imagine this is the graph that we start out, start out with. And we, we first are exploring this, uh, this road segment marked in blue. Um, from here, if we try to expand this way, we hit the perimeter of the neighborhood, and so we can't do anything. And so we have to we have to pick either this way or this way to to expand out. Um, it doesn't really like the the order of expansion doesn't matter for this purpose. So let's say we expand this way, uh, then we do the same thing. But then um, now we've hit a filter, uh, and so the the search process will back up and say um, let's look either this way or this way. Um, and in this case, it picks the south. And so we just sort of repeat this process until we've covered the whole the whole area. And so this is what the result looks like if we just color the streets where um, the you know all of the purple uh, roads are kind of connected to each other, all of the blue ones are, but the the two aren't connected to each other. Um, and so if you're familiar with graph theory, this is uh, like this is each cell is sort of a strongly connected component. That's just a fancy way of saying that um, you can reach everywhere from everywhere else within that that part of the graph without kind of leaving the area. Um, but of course, the like this view where we we color the roads isn't quite as useful. Like I think the these diagrams that uh, are communicated out are quite are quite nice. And so, how can we match this? Um, if you know a little bit of uh, geometry, you might be familiar with something called a Veroni diagram. Each of these areas is sort of the like the area that is uh, closest to to each point, um, closer to that point than any other point. And so this this is like a little bit what we want. But the problem is um, all of the algorithms for computing Veroni diagrams work off of individual points. And uh, we have like road segments, you know, like it's not straightforward to, to figure out like how to how to treat this as a bunch of different points and, and do the same thing. Um, and so the, the trick that the software uses is called, uh, or it, it just chops the world into like a 10 by 10 meter grid um, and does this, uh, this sort of like expansion process um, uh, across that grid. And so like walking through how, how it works, if you imagine kind of a 10 by 10, by 10 grid overlaid on this, we start by uh, taking the colored streets and kind of like looking for the uh, the tile in the grid that matches up, and we'll color that with um, just a different color for for every cell. And so at first, like the the grid cell, the, the grid kind of approximates the shape of the streets. And so we'll just expand this um, step by step. And so like if we take every uh, every like blue blue tile and kind of um, visit the the neighbors in in all four directions and expand out after one round, things kind of look like this. Uh, and you'll notice over here that the like yellow and blue tiles have kind of touched each other or touch, touched each, each other. And so um, we won't expand and like have the colors mix. And instead we'll, rec we'll record the fact that these two, uh, these two cells are adjacent. And that means that we can then color them something different uh, so that it's easier to distinguish. And so after a third step, maybe things look like this. And if we, if we keep repeating, we, we get the nice result. Um, 
Uh, and this is just a detail. So the like, if, if you chop things up into a grid, then you wind up with like very jagged edges like this, and it doesn't look very nice. Um, luckily, there's an algorithm called marching squares that takes uh, takes a grid like this and, and smooths out the, the contours. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is just a, a way to kind of clean up the results a little bit. Um, so when we're when we're considering the different cells, it's important to uh, to think about a lot of weird edge cases that happen. One is that sometimes streets have have uh, are, have one way restrictions for cars, and so um, I a little bit lied when I earlier said you can drive from anywhere within a cell to anywhere else. Like if you uh, if you start in a building here, all you can do is leave the neighborhood because of the one way restriction. Um, but if you start here, like you you can go from this building to this building, and so. Uh, for the purposes of the software, like it, it treats these as one area instead of like splitting it up into a bunch of different pieces. And I think that's the more intuitive definition for uh, for a cell in this case. Um, there, there, we also do have to figure out what to do with uh, sort of interior roads in a neighborhood that don't allow motor vehicles. Like maybe this is some kind of park um, with a bike path or a trail in the middle. It gets a little bit unclear. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the choice in the software is still to compute a cell for this and color it green to kind of indicate it's, it's special. And you can't you can't place a filter here. Like this road is already sort of filtered. There's no there's no vehicle traffic allowed. Um, and then this is a particularly uh, weird case where, like, would you consider this entire blue area to be one cell or not? Um, like, it is possible to drive from from this street to the rest, but you have to uh, you have to take a turn through this intersection that's right along the perimeter. Um, and so it's a little bit weird. Like, it, it's a little bit unclear if, if this should be considered one cell or not. And so another way of uh, asking this question is to look at this red path and say, does this leave the neighborhood? Um, and uh, ultimately, it's a little bit of a judgment call. But I think um, the results from the software are more intuitive if we do consider this to be two, two different cells. And so this is what the uh, the tool does in this one edge case. Um, yeah. Uh, right. So next, this, uh, let's talk about how the, um, the rat run prediction works. And so uh, this is the, the view where um, the the deeper colored red shows you is predicting that there's more uh, bit, there's more ways to take a shortcut through the neighborhood, which is um, colloquially known as like a rat run. Um, whereas all of the streets uh, colored white, like there's there's no reason to drive here unless your um, your destination is one of these buildings. And so uh, let's walk through kind of how this works. And so I, um, this is an example of a route that crosses uh, that takes a, a shortcut through the, the middle of the neighborhood. And so this intuitively is what we want to call a rat run. Um, but to formalize a little bit, uh, I'm going to say that it's a, uh, um, a shortest path that starts and ends somewhere on the perimeter road and, and goes through the middle of the neighborhood. Um, and it's important to notice or, or to note that this definition is, uh, is scoped to a single neighborhood. And so um, this particular path, like we don't know how many people are going to try to take this route or if this even makes sense. Like maybe, you know, there's nothing over here and there's also nothing over here. Like this isn't even a, a route that somebody would ever try to do or, or many people would try to do. Um, but at this stage of analysis, we're not we're not really worrying about that. Uh, we're just looking at what's what's possible. Um, but we do need to refine the definition a little bit. So technically, this is a this is a path that uh, begins in the neighborhood, or begins on the perimeter and ends on the perimeter. But all it does is like take th you know a go a couple blocks, uh, avoid the main road for a couple blocks. And so this is probably not a rat run. Um, and so the software will sort of detect like is it a different road. Uh, on the on the entry and the exit by looking at the the name of the arterial road there, um, and that that approximation like works well enough in most cases. Um, and this is another this is another weird case. So imagine that uh, somebody enters the neighborhood going west, um, and we we put a filter here. Uh, the fastest thing for them to do, according to like a route finding algorithm, is actually just to to turn around, take the main road, uh, and then cut back into the neighborhood at the end. And the reason it's faster to do that is that the the main road has like a much higher speed limit. Um, but of course, this isn't really what we want to, to show because like the the motivation of a rat run is that the main road is sort of backed up. And so um, we instead restrict the the shortest path search, the shortest path search to stay within the interior of the neighborhood. And then we get kind of the results we expect. If we put a filter here, then the detour will will still stay in the, the in the neighborhood and, and cut through uh, like that. So um, the final results, if we uh, if we have something that starts like this and we put a filter down, the traffic detours, we we try another filter and um, you know we we can see the see the rat running kind of move live and uh, we know when we've fixed the problem because the the colors will change and we'll we'll actually split the cell or not. Um, next, I want to talk about how to define a neighborhood. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that a neighborhood is is just the area that's bounded on all sides by a major road. Um, but that definition is uh, is very oversimplified. So I want to like highlight 
some ways that it's a little bit weird. Um, so first to note is that uh, this definition will cross um, bodies of water, whether they're small or large, and also railroads. So I think this is an, uh, this is like Primrose Hill in London. Uh, this this highlighted area is sort of one is one neighborhood according to the software, even though we have a rail line running through, and even though the Regent's Canal is right there. Um, and so the reason this is the case is that imagine we we stopped at the uh, the boundary of the water um, and just treated this yellow area as the neighborhood boundary. Um, that means that the like the outermost streets along this neighborhood, we would say that they're okay to have high amounts of traffic. Um, and clearly here, that's not the case. They're like they're small local roads. Um, and so like to to reason about what roads should have traffic or not, sometimes we have to cross boundaries like that. Um, and um, but so the, this process of like tracing along major roads is a little bit weird. So this is an example in Manchester where um, these two these two major roads colored orange, they just kind of end. And actually, like, I'm not sure why they don't like according to the road classification open street map, they're, they're not actually connected. And so, uh, you know, this one neighborhood, the interior of it contains this like this main road that just kind of ends. It's, it's a bit of a weird case. Um, and then this is another issue. Uh, actually, I'll just like show you in the tool. Um, over in an area of Seattle. So uh, anytime, so th this is an artifact of how OpenStreetMap representation works. If we have a, a dual carriageway or like a, a major road that's um, one way each direction and has some kind of median in between, uh, you know, our definition of neighborhood is like take a major road and trace along the boundary of it. Technically this, you know, this little bit in the middle of the two roads is a neighborhood. Uh, and, you know, clearly this is like, this is not a neighborhood. There's nothing, there's nothing in the interior, um, but the, Right, like the software will treat this as a certain neighborhood, uh, and I guess like you just can't really do do much analysis on it. But it, it is worth noting uh, this is this is something to to look out for. Um, and so you know, for for all of the reasons above, the like the default neighborhood boundaries are not um, are not perfect, and uh, you know sometimes like the the cl classification for what's a major road um, versus a minor road, like this this can vary in OpenStreetMap and like vary regionally and stuff like that. Uh, and um, like an, an even more important thing to note is like a lot of time the resistance to an to an LTN uh, scheme is more is not about the or it is more about the uh, the definition of the boundary. Like LTNs sort of say that it's okay to have more traffic along the boundary because those roads are designed for it. But uh, people get upset about this, particularly when they live on the on that boundary road. And so really, like what they're asking for is. Um, like the the big road that they live on to be treated as uh, a local road and have less traffic. Um, and like, uh, yeah, for my few months in London, I guess like I, I've been per very perplexed why a lot of the, the the big shopping streets are like treated as as three routes, particularly when there's like tons and tons of foot traffic. Like in my mind, this could be the middle of an LTN um, and like closed down to uh, to be access only. And so like these are these are conversations that are uh, that are worth having. Like the road classification is something that was done you know sometimes decades ago when our priorities were very different. Um, and so sort of for all of these reasons. Uh, I'm just saying that like the the software comes up with an initial boundary for neighborhoods, but you can you can adjust it, um, and it's very important that you do adjust it uh, to match what you know people in your in your area uh, want and need. Um, and so, for example, we can uh, we can start with this boundary and uh, like aggressively expand it to this, even though um, all of these orange roads are are classified as arterials. Uh, you know, like maybe a conversation needs to happen about turning them into into local streets and treating that treating them that way instead. Um, so how exactly does this process work? Uh, so it, it sort of works at the the block by block uh, basis. And so each of these like colored areas um, is taking uh, each road and like walking along the edge of it and, and capturing all of the space in between. Um, and then these roads, like the, the adjacent blocks are kind of merged together and we treat the like the contiguous uh, shape as a, as a neighborhood. Um, and if you sort of like remove a block from one neighborhood, uh, you add it to another. Like there, there's always a, like a block belongs to exactly one neighborhood at a time. Um, and so uh, this is like, I, I want to get into these details because this is the hardest part of building the software, actually like tracing along the, the blocks and dividing the space this way, which uh, feels like a, a very minor detail in the scheme of things, but it's it's been the most difficult thing to to get working. And I think the results are kind of interesting. So um, like from the from the shape of the roads and the intersections in OpenStreetMap, this process will will walk along the edge and um, kind of track uh, each side of the road and, and put it in a list so that you get like a contiguous shape that looks like this. Um, and actually, we can just uh, look at a live version of this instead. Um, so uh, like the, the shapes of a different block can get pretty, pretty strange. Like in this case, um, you know, like we have this kind of like weird dead end in the middle. 
but just to, to highlight what's going on here, like we can walk through the perimeter in order and say like, this is the first road, this is the second road, this is the third and so on. And like this process will we'll trace, a, trace a loop. Um, and then what we can do is, uh, is merge two, two blocks that are adjacent um, to create the bigger shape and ultimately the neighborhood. And so the way this works is that we, um, we find the overlapping road segments uh, between the two different blocks and we kind of line up the, like the list of, uh, of roads and then um, like merge it together. And so uh, kind of show, show you an example of this, like maybe the simple case is we wanna merge these two blocks. Um, they share a single kind of road segment in the middle. And so once we merge, we get like a, a single shape like this and it, it like, it gets rid of the road in the middle. Um, but this process can get like quite exotic and weird. Like here, uh, here we start with this, this uh, one shape and maybe like we, uh, we wanna merge this in and like now it shares two roads in the middle, but there's actually also like this interior dead end, um, but the process still works and it'll kind of eat all of the, the stuff in the middle. Um, and so the way that it works is, uh, right, here's the results of that. Um, the way that it works, there, there are some uh, there are some things to take care of. So first, if there is this like dead end road in between, like we the we, we want the, like the, the common area between the two blocks to sort of match up. And so first we have to like detect the dead end and kind of collapse it out. Um, and then the second thing is that like the uh, the order of the the blocks could either be clockwise or counterclockwise depending on how they're built. Um, and ideally, it would always be like one orientation. But um, there's a a concept in geometry called winding order of a polygon that sort of tells you clockwise versus counterclockwise. And in short, some of the like very strangely shaped geometry in OpenStreetMap like this um, or like this, like it's, it's difficult to calculate the winding order in all cases. Um, and so instead of trying to do that, the, the tool will attempt to merge the two blocks and like assume that they're both clockwise. And if that if that is uh, is incorrect and it fails, it'll just reverse the second block and try again. Um, and then usually that'll work. Um, so uh, it's important to note that like because this is the most complex part of the software, there's a lot of limitations to it. Uh, so one issue is um, that like this process only traces along uh, roads and not natural features. And so here we have like a larger body of water uh, and you'll note that like there's there's nothing colored here. There's no block. We can't reason about LTNs or place filters in this area, um, and that's because like sort of the outermost road uh, in this case kind of is this this main road here. Excuse me. Um, and like the, you know, if we if we put a filter here and wanted to reason about where vehicles go instead, like th there's no way to drive along the edge of the water, and so uh, like we can't really reason about all of the space in this way. Um, and then similarly, like the all of the uh, sorry, all of the maps in AB Street have a particular study area. So in this case, it's just a, like a square. Um, and like outside that area, we can't reason about anything. Uh, like we don't know what the, the nearest road sort of right off the map is. And so the, the software doesn't try to trace the block there or anything like that. Um, and then uh, another issue is the, like anytime we have bridges and tunnels, um, the, the results are very messy uh, and kind of look like this. And um, in short, that like there's not an easy way to deal with this. Uh, like when we have bridges and tunnels overlapping each other, like we can't really play this exercise of tracing along the the, the boundary of a road because the roads will, will cross each other. Um, and so at the moment, I don't I don't uh, I don't have a good answer for this, but I'm still still kind of working on it. Um, the takeaway is uh, sometimes we can't draw the boundaries we want um, to kind of show this problem in action. Um, if we go back to Bristol, uh, like maybe I want to. Um, like have a very large boundary that looks like this. Uh, you'll see that it like it didn't actually um, add a bunch of the areas that I wanted. And so, like one example of a problem uh, that I hope is fixable is like here. Um, I want to add this block, but you'll see you'll notice that there's like a little hole in the middle. Um, the software won't let us create create a hole in the the middle of the the neighborhood. But there's also no way to add this uh, the hole to the boundary before we add the outer area. And so like there, there's nothing you can do as a user. Um, and so uh, I'm I'm working on a, a way to, to work through this, but just in the meantime, be aware that this is a limitation of the of the tool. Um, yeah. So now let's talk about over set, uh, assessing overall impact. So you know, imagine you make a bunch of changes across across multiple neighborhoods, um, and you want to understand like the overall traffic changes in the area. Uh, we could do something simple and just like per neighborhood show that rat run view um, and kind of color streets across the whole map as either like likely to have traffic or not. Uh, but this analysis is still done at the neighborhood level, and it, it doesn't really tell us if uh, if traffic is spilling over from one neighborhood to another. Um, and uh, right, so um, yeah, that's basically what I just said. Uh, and so really to, to do better, we need something called a travel demand model. Um, we need to know 
where people are drive, where people's driving trips are starting and ending. Because if we had that, what we could do is uh, is calculate the path that they would take before any filters are installed, and then repeat the process um, and calculate all of the the likely paths that would happen after we install new filters. Uh, and just look at the difference, count how many people would use a road um, before and after, and, and then display that data somehow. Um, but that process relies on this thing called a travel demand model that tells you um, where trips begin and end. Um, and uh, right, so if we had this, like there is a mode in the tool um, that lets you kind of predict the overall impact. But right now, this, this tool doesn't really tell you anything useful because we don't have good uh, demand data, unfortunately. So. Um, in the UK, uh, I've been using the 2011 census data, which has information about how many people uh, travel between their home and their workplace in different areas. And so this is this is like well over 10 years old. Um, it, it was only restricted to like a single trip purpose, you know, not not uh, going shopping or visiting friends. And like the the concept of traveling for work is is something that like the pandemic has very much uh, made weird. And so like you know th this travel demand model doesn't really uh, doesn't really work basically. Um, and we, we need we need better data now or better data that's that's more current. Um, so one attempt to do this, I've been working with a group called Urban Observatories, and uh, they have a bunch of traffic counts, uh, traffic counters, particularly around new LTNs. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't really help us directly because, like, if if you know that say five thousand vehicles per hour uh, like pass through a road, that doesn't really tell you enough because it does you don't know where those vehicles are, are starting and ending their trips, and so we can't really like plug it into the pathfinding before and after an LTN change. Um, but uh, if you're in the audience and you you have your own demand data, uh, even if it's not public, like we can come up with the way of, of transforming it into a format that uh, the software can use. And you, you don't have to like share the, like you, you could run everything on your own computer um, if there's like issues with data privacy and stuff like that. Like if you have your own data, you can plug it into the tool uh, and make use of it and, and try, to, try to get the overall impact. Um, just to, uh, I guess a uh, time check, I'll, I'll speed up a bit. Um, the the software gives you some some tools for placing filters automatically. Um, like everything I showed you so far is, uh, is is sort of like, we have to look at the the area and decide where a filter goes. And I think this is always important for like people to do this, but um, it can be useful for the, the software to, to give you some hints. Like imagine you have a, a budget of one filter to place uh, in this area. Um, like the, yeah, I guess like a few automated heuristics are you could look for the road that has the most rat running and put it there. Um, but this won't really solve the problem in a lot, in a lot of cases. It'll just move things over. And so, uh, yeah, this, this this approach is not very good. Um, there's also uh, a particular like school of thought in the LTN design community where like each cell should have exactly one entrance and exit. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of bizarre trade-offs with this, but um, you know whether this is a good, a good idea or not, the software, like you can just sort of do this with one click if you wanted to try it out. Um, and then the, uh, I think the, the heuristic that works really well is um, this this concept of taking a large cell and splitting it into two pieces. And so this was like if I uh, if I tried the if I looked at the original picture and said um, where should a single filter go, the the place that I picked um, is here, and like these are the resulting cells. But uh, if we ask the software, it'll it'll find something that I think splits it uh, a lot more evenly. Um, and this is based on something called the minimum cut of the graph, which I, I guess I won't go into. Um, but in short, the like it tries to find a single road that will uh, split the cell into two pieces, but then also try to maximize the size of those cells, um, because like of course like you can trivially make new cells by putting new filters right along the boundary of the neighborhood, but this probably like doesn't do anything interesting except to the people you know living right along the the boundary there. Um, and then uh, what do you do with like American style uh, gridded streets like this? Like it's sort of difficult to come up with a minimal number of filters to split this area. You, you probably do need a fair bit. Um, but I will mention that the tool lets you uh, draw diagonal filters at intersections. And so you can create these like, I think this is like the Barcelona style super block um, with like the, the diagonal thing. Uh, you can experiment with that too, if you want. Um, yeah, so I guess to, to wrap up this part of the talk, uh, the although the software is still in development, uh, I very much like think people can, can use it now and want people to use it now. Um, the main feature that I'm working on is the ability to take the proposals that you save and just upload them and be able to share uh, a link that anybody can visit. Um, then there's also, I guess, like a bunch of uh, uh, feature requests that I've heard heard again and again to like redesign one-way streets or to figure out how bus buses can uh, pass through filters. Um, and so I'm, I'm working on all of these things and kind of interested in them. And uh, additionally, I'm, I'm trying to have training material finished within about a week. Um, and so if you work at a council and you, you know, you should be able to just like watch a video on YouTube on how to use this tool 
uh, and that that can sort of be the initial training for uh, for how to use it. Um, but yeah, despite this, like a few places are kind of like already using the tool in some official capacity, and a bunch of other places are are exploring it. And so I'm I'm quite happy about that. Uh, yeah. So the engagement model, um, basically, uh, if you want to use this in in your area, um, and your area is not imported yet, email me and I can help set it up. Um, if you happen to have travel demand data, then um, we can get into a format where the tool can can tell you about the overall impact. Um, and then the, the sort of things that I would like for, like in return is uh, is feedback about what what else the tool should help do. Um, and then uh, yeah, I guess I, I'm also trying to sort of grow a bit of a team to work on this. Like um, it's been a very small amount of effort, or sorry, a small number of people putting an effort to this. And if we had more people working on it, I think it could do pretty cool things. And so um, if you have the resources to Help me help me get other people. Uh, we should we should talk. Um, and yeah, so uh, very importantly, like low traffic neighborhoods are one particular planning intervention, but they're they're just sort of the start. Um, it's I think it's extremely important to follow up with interventions on the perimeter roads because in the short term, probably you're going to see more traffic displaced there. Uh, and some of the things that people like care about in this case are are making sure that there's like safe crossings across these perimeter roads, um, and sort of looking at uh, like bus and cycle lanes. Um, to make sure that like people aren't get, or to make sure that uh, the the higher levels of traffic on perimeter roads aren't slowing uh, people down, and then maybe you even need to like adjust traffic signal timing because you have different numbers of people uh, moving through and stuff. Um, and so the uh, the larger project that I've been running called AB Street has some other other pieces that can help out, um, and maybe I'll just like quickly show you an example um, in uh, let's say downtown. Um, like imagine that uh, along the perimeter road, you know, you see a lot of you see a lot more traffic, and um, you want to do something about it. So, like maybe you have like a, a five lane general purpose road. Um, so, so AB, uh, different parts of AB Street have a lot of tools. Like for example, there's a way to just uh, reallocate road space, and we could take this and uh, turn it into say like a bus lane, um, or we could add uh, like protected cycle lanes and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different tooling built into the like the, the rest of the software. Um, and there's even like a sort of like a traffic simulation if you need to visualize how uh, how people will use the new space. Um, and yeah, I guess like there's a lot of a lot of the uh, a lot of prior work in other parts of the software. And I'm interested in um, in developing uh, new tools in the future, particularly to focus on like planning bus routes. Um, but yeah, so just basically the like LTNs are not the full picture. I'm interested in in uh, in advancing all parts of all parts of planning, um, I wanted to wrap up by uh, pointing out the slight irony that like this is a conference about artificial intelligence, and uh, nothing I've shown you is really uh, machine learning or, or, or artificial intelligence in the usual sense. Um, but I actually think it's kind of important that that uh, that's the case. It's because um, like there's sort of classic computer science graph algorithms that have been known like well known uh, for decades, and uh, and they're kind of all we need to to use to solve uh, problems around designing LTNs. Um, and it's it's kind of nice that we, uh, like these well understood results that are not very, you know, there's not a lot of magic to them. Uh, this means that the results are very explainable. And so like, you don't need to, you have less concerns about like public mistrust of stuff. So like, if the software says, uh, you know, it's impossible to drive between two points because it, it's split into different cells, or if it shows a particular rat run through, like a human can look at that and like, Clearly, see if if it's uh, if it's correct or if there's a problem with like the data, um, there's some bug. Like it, it's very easy to argue with the software. There's not a lot of magic behind it, and I think that's that's critical for uh, for sort of winning public trust. And um, yeah, to like uh, to iterate this point, like because there's been so much public uh, backlash against LTNs and similar schemes, like I think it's important to get people on the same page and to design changes to streets that are uh, like that benefit kind of everybody and and help get everyone on the same page. And so particularly this like model where you get get your community into a room and kind of like do a live workshop and redesign stuff. Um, like I hope this can uh, this this tool could be used in that setting to to get people on the same page. Um, yeah, so uh, here's how you get to the tool and the, the links will be in the uh, in the Google Doc. Um, please contact me if you want to uh, use it in your area or you know, or ho however else. Um, Thanks. I think now we'll uh, we'll take questions. So, um, George, I know you've been in the in the request for a while. I'll go ahead and let you in if you have a question. And then, if anyone else, oh, we lost him. So, if anyone else wants to come on video, that would be really great. Uh, if not, throw questions in the chat. 
there was a suggestion from Matt. Um, Dustin, have you heard of this playing out? It's resident led community organization. I've seen, I haven't heard of that group. I've seen, I know a similar program back in Seattle. Um, they like, they show, yeah, temporary street closures and like uh, design alternative uses of the, of the space for the day. I think uh, this would be really cool to, to get in touch with them. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Thanks. Hi, Dustin. Hello. Yeah. Um, very nice to see all the progress you've made. Um, just picking up on one of the last points you were making uh, about getting public trust. Um, I think demand models are pretty important too because you need to be able to predict when, when you have put an LTN, where where the dive, where the displaced traffic is going to going to be, and uh, demand demand is what determines that, of course. Um, getting getting public information about people's intentions and what and what routes they use seems to be, be increasingly important. There there is a um, I don't know if you know that there's a British company called uh, Vivacity, who are AI, another AI company, but they um, are focused entirely on analyzing street activities using cameras, and uh, they they are able to count individual vehicles, including their origins and destinations, because they've got the number uh, number plates on the car. Um, and as it happens, the area that we're, that Jude and I have been you know, are, are living in and have done work on is, has actually had a study done by, paid for by our local authority to get the uh, origins and destinations for the journeys over, a, was it a week? Uh, anyway, a period. Uh, so that kind of information seems to be being increasingly important because then you can actually predict how things might, may change when you put in the old hand. Yeah, um, yeah um, we, we, like, we definitely need this kind of data. And actually, like, Vivacity, I think... Um, can you your, I can probably mute you, sorry. I'm just going to, just because that echo, there we go, that hopefully fixes it. Ah, yeah. Um, so the, the Urban Observatories group in Manchester that I've been working in, actually, I think the... Um, the traffic count data comes from the vivacity cameras that they have. Uh, so I know that those groups are already talking to each other. Um, I think that the issue there is either they didn't have the like automated nameplate recognition on those particular sensors, or uh, they didn't yet have enough funding to cover to cover a wide area and, and know where people are kind of going in and out. Um, but if anybody knows of like public data sources of this kind of thing, like I can find a way to convert it into the right format. Um, like I think this is a problem that has to be solved for for like a lot of other reasons, not just uh, not just like LTN planning, but like basically any any kind of traffic study needs to have a, a good demand model. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm always on the hunt for uh, for for better methods and data there. Yeah, if only we could put up our own cameras and collect our own data, but I guess that's outside the law for privacy reasons. Yeah, sounds like not the not the best idea. <laughs> um, I see somebody on the chat was asking about uh, like a blog or other work. Um, I I don't have a blog, but uh, I have a bunch of previous presentations that I just put a link to. Um, and in case you're interested in some of the like the more uh, technical detail of uh, of how some of this work, uh, or how some of this stuff works, um, I put a few links of things that that might be interesting, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll consider a blog. Hi, Anne. Thanks for joining. Hello. Um, I was just interested in. I used to be a, a postie once, once upon a time, and they used to have very um, sort of strict set routes they would have to follow. So they basically had had their own established neighbourhoods, as it were. So I was wondering if you were working with sort of private um, companies to establish these new. Um, low traffic neighborhoods i there was especially a problem with them the council blocking off roads in as you say the rat runs and it was very difficult to get around them to deliver like heavy parcels and things like that 
So I just wondered how, um, and the, I imagine now with the onset of Amazon Prime and things like that, there's a lot more um, vans going around delivering quite heavy things, obviously can't be dragged around on a, on a posty trolley. So I, I just wondered how you were like correlating um, and wor working with them, basically, if you um, were. Yeah, I'm, I'm not yet. Uh, sort of the, like, it's difficult to scale up my my own effort and work with a bunch of different groups in different areas. Like my goal is to to make a tool that's not like the end all be all. This thing tells you how to do LTNs. It just it's an extra tool that people can use. And so, for example, uh, like the way that probably like the the feature request that I'm that I'm hearing here is like uh, somebody delivering parcels should be able to kind of draw the existing route that they take and uh, compare that against what the the proposed LTN. Uh, scheme is and see how their how their route will be impacted if if it'll still be possible to like make the efficient deliveries that they're doing today, um, and then like ultimately it has to be a conversation between them and like the the many other stakeholders and stuff involved. Uh, but um, yeah, if you know of any data sources that have like the the current routes that they follow or like maybe it's it's not public, then um, I can look for a way to integrate that into the tool so that they can still, uh, so that they can like see how the changes will impact them and, and kind of have a say in, in the design. Okay, I might, I will ask, but probably not since Royal Mail uh, was privatized a bit ago. Um, so just one more question. Uh, what with the, the planters that you were talking about before with the roadblocks and um, obviously sort of ever-changing events like road closures and accidents and things like that, how is the app going to sort of update in real time and where, where, where would it get its updates from? Um, so I don't think the, the app is meant to be used in, in a real time setting at all. It's sort of like for this offline design process, um, once the, like the filters go in place or there are like uh, temporary detours and, and uh, accidents and stuff like that, like I believe that councils have a way of informing like the large companies like Google and Apple of, uh, of, of new like traffic orders and road closures and stuff like that. Like there, there's no, there's no change here with that. Um, like, I don't, I don't think the software is appropriate to use in any kind of like real time setting. People should continue to like use the methods that they're, the, that they're doing to report accidents or to report um, these like road closures and stuff. Like this is just a way to help plan where some of the closures, some of the closures go. But great it question. Might be, worth question. Mentioning, might be worth mentioning that OpenStreetMap does get updated by the group of volunteers who, who, who maintain it very frequently, and therefore any new filters will appear within day, a few days usually on OpenStreetMap. Yeah. Um, if uh, if the data is is updated in OpenStreetMap, like the, the maps imported into AB Street are kind of uh, like they're imported once and, and fixed. Um, if you uh, mm. if you go to like the change map dialog, there's a there's an option that uh, appeared a few weeks ago to to kind of grab the latest OpenStreetMap data um, and re-import it. Uh, so you could sort of use that in the short term. And then if your if your area is being updated a lot, um, you can also email me and ask to like I, I can I can re-import so that uh, you'll have fresh data on the next release if that's an issue. Um, anybody else? I guess we only have one minute, so technically I shouldn't ask for more questions. Um, so please hold on to that uh, link to the Google Doc. You've got Dustin's info there, as well as the email for the RAM team. So for instance, you know, Dustin mentioned maybe an interactive workshop. Um, and that's the kind of thing where, where you could email ram at turing.ac.uk and, and go through us, and we'll help you set that up and, and um, figure out what works for for you and for for Dustin, so so yeah, definitely um, hold on to those those. Um, sorry, it's been a long day. I'm losing I'm losing my language here. Um, but hold on to that doc. You've got contact info. You've got lots of great links. Thanks everybody for your uh, input and your participation. And um, go enjoy the the last thing over on the main stage is a comedy session. So that should be pretty funny. Thank you, Dustin. Have a good day. Thank everybody. you. Yeah, and thanks for everyone who attending. Uh, feel free to get in touch and have a have a good day. Bye.